Amen. All right. Well, of course, we'll go through a little bit of review of what we went over last week. In our beginning scripture tonight is in Luke, where Luke wrote, Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And you yourselves, like men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. In other words, you need to have your lights burning and yourselves ready at all times so that when he does return. Now, of course, this is speaking about the uh, second group that goes up. This is the mid-tribulation people. That's the reason why it says, when he will return from the wedding. We've already had the wedding. We've all been up there and had a great time. Now he's coming back for the ones that uh, are, were standing outside going, let us in, but weren't ready. We're talking about, remember the ten virgins? You had five wise, five unwise. He came back for the unwise virgins. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he comes, shall find watching Verily I say to you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. So he's still going to serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or in the third watch, find them so. Blessed are these servants. So like we've been teaching all throughout this time, be watchful. Because if you're not watching for him, when he comes back, he's not looking for you. In review, what we talked about is about Zechariah last week out of chapter 14. Last week we studied in Zechariah 14 what he had to say about the day of wrath. Wasn't a very pretty picture. Jesus using the sword of his mouth, in other words, speaking the word, the plague that the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. This is the last day when he steps out of the clouds with all the saints behind him and he starts speaking the word to all of those that are fighting against God. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet and their eyes shall consume away in their holes and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. There will also be in that day a great commotion from the Lord that will be among them and they will all rise up against each other as a neighbor against the hand of his neighbor. In other words, it causes such a great tumult. There will be so much smoke on that battlefield that they won't know the enemy from anyone else, and they will just start killing everyone that's around them. It's not a good place to be. We find that the last two verses of Zechariah 14 reveal in that day that even upon the bells of the horses, holiness to the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts, and all that sacrifice shall come and take of them and boil therein. And in that day there shall be no more Canaanite in the house of the Lord, in the Lord, of the Lord of hosts. What it's speaking of? Holiness to the Lord, the same as was on the mitre to the high priest. Remember the high priest that goes in before the Lord to do the sacrifice and do his work before God behind the veil. On his mitre, on his uh, mitre that goes on his turban as being the high priest was inscribed the Jewish words, holiness to the Lord. Now holiness to the Lord will be inscribed on everything in Israel because everything in Israel will be considered holy before the Lord. That's talked about in Zechariah. It's also talked about in Exodus 28, 36. It will adorn even the bells of the horses. Of course, that means everything that had to do with the military paraphernalia and everything else within Israel. The distinction between holy and profane will cease inasmuch as even the most outward things and things having no connection whatsoever to worship will be as holy as those objects formerly were which were dedicated to the service of Jehovah by special consecration. The graduated distinction between things which were more holy or less holy is brought out. 
The pots in the sanctuary which were used for boiling the sacrificial meats were regarded as, as much less holy than the sacrificial bowls in which the blood of the sacrificial animals was received and out of which it was sprinkled or poured upon the altar. When it spoke about the Canaanites there, it's the Canaanites all throughout Israel's history represented people who were morally and spiritually unclean, reprehensible to God, and doomed to death. In other words, they were the spiritual seed of Cain, and that's what he's talking about. There will be no more Canaanites coming into Israel. We also talked about the thousand-year reign. Talked about in Isaiah chapter 11. Shows us that in the time of the thousand-year reign, that the wolf will dwell with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the kid and the calf with the young lion and fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones will lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The suckling child shall play on the hole of an asp, which is a very dangerous snake. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the viper's den. Something longed for, but today hard to even imagine with what we see with our own eyes today. In Isaiah 65, we learned that our Lord will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in his people. The voice of weeping will be heard no more in her. There will be no more thereafter death of an infant nor an old man that has not filled his years. In other words, premature death will no longer be heard of, except we'll be talking about infant mortality and pure premature death are eradicated. Everyone will live a long and fruitful life. However, if a person dies at the age of 100 years, they will be considered a child, but will also know that it was the due curse of a sinner. So even during the thousand-year reign, if someone dies at a hundred years or less, it was because they were a sinner that was cursed that never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Sinners are not going to live long in the kingdom. In other words, their life will be short and they're considered to be children at a hundred years of age because during the thousand year reign, everyone will go back to as it was before Noah living to 900 and 1,000 years. So even if there are some really old people that survive, you know, somebody 75 to 80 years old that survives and comes into the 1,000-year reign, there will be a change in the atmosphere that allows him to continue living even beyond what we consider normal today. The age limit will be removed whereas today it's a maximum of 120 years is what he gave us. Then we talked about the priesthood because God calls us his kings and priests. So whose priests are we? Levites? No. Of the priest of the order of Aaron? No. The priesthood of Melchizedek was by sovereign appointment of God. It was not inherited from his parents, and there is no mention of his priesthood ever beginning or ending. In Hebrews 7, 3, it tells us that he was without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. He was a created being. In these and other ways, the Melchizedek priesthood is superior to that of Levi and Aaron. Melchizedek was a foreshadowing of the Lord Jesus. Our Lord's priesthood was not a matter of parentage. He was of the tribe of Judah, not Levi. Jesus' priesthood is established by the sovereign, eternal decree of God. And since he lives in the power of an endless life, his priesthood will never end. Psalm 110, we went over in great detail because it's a well-established psalm in the New Testament and one of the most quoted psalms in the New Testament. It was written by David, who was the first king priest in type after Melchizedek. And Jesus will rule from the throne of David.
What we see in the scriptures in Genesis chapter 14 where it talks about Melchizedek when Abraham comes to visit him. And Hebrews chapter 7, it's actually chapters 5 through 7 in Hebrews where it makes a comparison of the different priesthoods that were stood up by God. And it shows that the priesthood of Melchizedek is far superior because that's whose priesthood Jesus is after. Establishes a pattern that is important for us to understand. Melchizedek is both a king and a priest. Jesus, both our high priest and king, and came after the order of Melchizedek. The word order, of course, means after the manner of or arrangement of, or we can even say after the pattern of. This is explained in Hebrews chapters 5 through 7. The pattern shows us that Melchizedek was king of Salem, which is now Jerusalem, which later became, which later became Jabus. It went through this order. It was uh, Salem first, then it became Jabus. David captured the city of Jabus and called it the city of David, which it later became Jerusalem. So David was also the king of Jerusalem. King Jesus will rule over Jerusalem for a thousand years on the earth, and then the new Jerusalem will come down out of heaven, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into the eternal city. Who are the kings of the earth? Melchizedek was a king and a priest, so was David, and so was Jesus. The book of Revelation is the revelation given by Jesus Christ to the apostle John. The first revelation that he gives to us is Jesus is the ruler over the kings of the earth. That's in Revelation 1.5. And then in the very next verse, it tells us who these kings, who these kings are. And he has made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Amen. Absolutely. But it's something that you're going to need to get into your heart, soul, and mind because you are a king and a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, not physically, but you are spiritually. You have authority over all the spiritual realm that has to do with Satan. He is under your feet for the very simple reason you are the kings and priests that God has appointed on this earth to keep him at bay. He who has the keys of David, this is spoken about in Revelation 3, 7, that's Jesus who has the keys of David, has made you to be his kings and priests. Jesus has set before each one of you an open door. That's in Revelation 3, 8. A door that leads to victory. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 tells us, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Strongholds is all the things that Satan tries to do in this world. In your life, in your area, over your household, over your job, anything that he can get a stronghold on to keep you from knowing who you are, he will do because he doesn't want you to believe it. And there's many that don't and that's the reason why they continue to be weak and sick. We are the kings and priests of the Most High God. The Lord Jesus Christ wants us to rule and reign with him as kings and priests according to the pattern set in ages past. Amen? And now, tonight we will be covering the last two chapters of Revelation, chapters 21 and 22. What does chapter 21 talk to us about? It starts talking to us about entering into eternity and helps to unveil it to us. Verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. This is even spoken of in Second Peter chapter 3. 
Starting at verse 1, it says, Peter wrote, I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Drops all the way down to verse 6. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved to fire against the day of judgment and per perdition of ungodly men. So even on the day of judgment of ungodly men is also when the heavens and the earth are refurbished. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. We're talking about at the end of the thousand year reign. Those people won't know what hit them. In which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. I can imagine. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting to the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And when it was talking about it would be melted, all the things would be melted with fervent heat. In other words, everybody at the end of the thousand year reign, when it's time for the judgment of the evil of the people that are pulled up out of hell, everything is pulled up off the earth. Everyone is pulled up off the earth, and the earth is completely remodeled. And he burns it. Everything you see on this earth, on this world right now, there will be nothing left of it. And not even a sign of it left. Verse 2 of Revelation chapter 21. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. In other words, New Jerusalem is God's tabernacle and it's coming down out of heaven. Doesn't say that it lands on the earth, but it does say it's coming down out of heaven. It may not ever actually touch the earth. And he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death. Death is a thing of the past. Neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. Can you imagine a time of no pain? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> amen. For the former things are passed away. We're talking about going into eternity after the end of the thousand year reign. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, talking to John, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end, I will give to him that is thirsty or a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. See, we're all going to be sons. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all the liars will have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came to me, John, one of the seven angels, which had, seven, had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come here. I will show you the bride, 
the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So now who is the bride of Jesus Christ? I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife, and he carries me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and shows me the great city, the holy city, Jerusalem. See, everybody believes that the church is the bride. It's like a bride, but we're not the bride. The holy city, Jerusalem. Remember, don't, you can't think of marriage in the same way we think about marriage as far as heavenly things. You have to think of it more along the lines of covenant. There's a huge difference because remember there is no marrying or giving in marriage in heaven. But there are covenants. And there came to me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying come here I will show you the bride the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to the great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of the heaven from God. And this usually blows everybody's mind when I get to this part. Because they're sitting here, but I thought the church was the bride of Christ. He treats us like a bride. But who are we a part of the body of? Christ is the head. He's the head of the church. We're a part of his body. So if anything, I guess we would be considered a part of the groom's party. You had a question? He is the head of the church. He is the leader of the church. We are all a part of that church. I know some of these things are hard to put your mind around, but it's written. Jerry didn't write that. But these are things that we have been taught for years and years and years and years. And the first time I heard it, I said, oh, that is garbage. I said, who, who put that crap out? And then you get in there and you read it in the Bible, it's kind of, oh, oh. Yes, Jerry did not write that. Jesus Christ put that word out to John. He said, this is the bride well, guess where we're going to live? As the church, we live, we stay with Jesus Christ in New Jerusalem. That is our permanent home, even though we may be working out in the earth at different locations. We are still his kings and priests, and he's in charge of all the kings. Remember that. That's another thing that a lot of people don't accept. Oh, no, no, no. We're not supposed to be kings and priests. That is only for Jesus and the apostles and those people. No, that's not what the Word of God said. It said his holy saints. All his holy saints are sitting in here. Well, not all of them, but some of his holy saints are all sitting here. So... This isn't Jerry's message. This is a message from God. It's hard to wrap your mind around, but he says these things are holy. That's the reason why he said these things are holy and true. Having the glory of God in her light was like a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and the names written thereon which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel in the east three gates on the north three gates on the south three gates and on the west three gates and the wall of the city had 12 foundations guess who those 12 foundations are and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lies four square. In other words, it's a cube, it's four square. 
And the length is as large as the breadth and the measure of the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The city is 14 to 1,500 miles cubed. Can you imagine the size? I'll help you out with that in a minute. The length and the breadth and the height are equal. And he measured the wall thereof 144 cubits, 216 feet thick, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And, of course, we had engineers that all came in and said that there is no way that a 216-foot thick wall can uphold a 14 to 1,500-mile-high wall. We're talking about God. I mean, for, for heaven's sake, it's, we don't need an engineer to come in and tell the great engineer how to build things. That is how much area that takes up. You see the square there? That's Israel, Cairo, Jordan, West Bank, Lebanon, Cyprus, Syria. That is how big the base or how big New Jerusalem is. So if it came down out of the clouds, that is, and it sat down there, that is how much area of the earth it would take up. If you put it on the United States, it would take up most of central U.S., all the way from the top down to the bottom. There'd be very little room on the east and west coasts. So it's quite large. But then God always did build things in a grandier way. Look at how he made the earth. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with, the ma with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second was sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth was sardius, the seventh was chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, and the tenth a chrysophrase, the eleventh a jacinth, and the twelfth an amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each and every gate was of one pearl. That's a big pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. In other words, it's not saying that it is gold that is transparent. It's saying it is as pure as transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. There's no temple in the city because God and Jesus are the temple. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did light it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. In other words, all the nations, the peoples that survive and get into the thousand-year reign. Well, of course, all those that survive and get into the end of the eternal time as well. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. Who are the kings of the earth? That's us. We are the kings of the earth. We work for King Jesus who is over all the kings of the earth. I know something that you haven't been taught, but these are the things that are written in the word of God, and they are true and just. And the gates of it will never be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. If there's no night then, and they're only going to be open during the day, that means they never shut And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall be in no wise enter into it anything that defiles. Neither whatsoever works abomination or makes a lie, but they that which are written in the Lamb's book of life. In other words, if you're not written in the Lamb's book of life, you're not going to be walking around in the city. Chapter 22, Entrance into Eternity. Chapter 22 is broken up into two parts. We talk a little more about the holy city, and then we get into the epilogue. In other words, where Jesus Christ talks to us and finishes up the story. 
In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 1, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the midst of the street of it, of the new Jerusalem, and on either side of the river the tree of life, which bear twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month in the leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations. Well, what does all that mean? Well, you get in and dig it all out. It says John, uh, John reveals to all that even though, I thought I corrected that. That's not thought, that's though. We enjoy the water of life today, which is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We will have pure sparkling like crystal river, like a crystal river of it flowing through us out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Jesus tells us in John chapter 4 and verse 23, the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such worship to him. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's the reason why I speak to y'all in spiritual terms, because God is a spirit. That's how we're supposed to be worshiping him, in spirit and in truth, because we're spiritual beings that are wearing a tent. Don't worry, the tent gets better when we get a new one. The tree of life, just as there was one in the Garden of Eden, there will be many in the New Jerusalem. They will bear 12 fruits, yielding her fruit every month. In other words, it will produce a different fruit each month according to the season. In other words, it's not producing all, the same, uh, all 12 fruits at one time each time. It's producing a different fruit every month of the 12 months. The leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations means just that. Just as today trees give us oxygen, everybody's aware that the leaves on all trees go through the photosynthesis process and takes all the carbon monoxide out of the air and gives us oxygen. Is it mon monoxide or dioxide? Both? Okay. Anyway, it takes the bad stuff out of the air and puts oxygen back into the air. These trees will also give healing to all nations. So these are special trees. Not only do they give off oxygen, they give off continuous healing to all so that you're never with pain or having any problems. But that means that, we're still, that there's still going to be flesh on the earth we're not going to be flesh because we've gone through the time period that God is looking for his rulers and reigners. Now there's others that's in the church that won't rule and reign, but they'll still be in heaven. Would you, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's right, okay. It was kind of like, oh, what'd you say? Okay. But the, and that unfortunately is the truth of it. That is something you have to wrap your mind around now what do you want? Do you just want to be someone that's in the kingdom, which is a marvelous thing in itself? Or do you also want to be there with Jesus as one of the rulers? And the reason why y'all keep coming back is because y'all want to learn more about Jesus Christ, and that's who he needs, is those who are learning about who he is and learning more about him and what his rule is, what, he, what it is that he came to this earth to do. He came to defeat the works of the enemy. He came to put all that down and to show people that there is a kingdom coming. There is a kingdom that you can have now. All you have to do is reach out and take it. It's a free gift. Now you can take that free gift if you want it. And that's all you get and now you just sit back and do nothing else. But if you want the rewards because it talks about rewards. All throughout here, it talks about rewards. And the, the hyper-religious will tell you, oh, we don't do this for rewards. Just being able to be with Jesus and be in the kingdom is all I need. Well, that's all they need. I'm going for the ring, just like all the apostles did, because that's what they said. Run the race as if though you want to win. Isn't that what they said? Amen. 
and there shall be no more curse. In other words, there's no more sin in eternity. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it in New Jerusalem, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign for ever and ever. One forever would have done it, but he wanted to make sure you understood. Forever and ever. That means it never ends. And now we come to where Jesus talks to us, letting us know, okay, this is the whole book, this has been all of Revelation that I have given to John. And he said to me, to John, these sayings are faithful and true. Didn't I just say that a minute ago? Jesus says that several times throughout here. These sayings are faithful and true. You either believe them or you don't. I would prefer that you believe them because they are faithful and true, every one of them. Even the fact that we aren't the bride, the city is. Because we have to think about marriage in heaven in a much different fashion. We are talking about covenant and we are in covenant right now with Jesus Christ. And he said to me, these sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show to his servant, servants, us, the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keeps the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Get that in your heart. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keeps the sayings of the prophecy of this book. He said, it's okay that you read it and understand it, but it's also that you need to keep it. In other words, it's been telling you all throughout here that you need to be watching because he's coming back soon. And you need to tell everybody else you can. Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready for the kingdom? And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard them and seen them, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. He was just so overcome. I mean, you know, after you'd seen all this amazing things that's coming in the future, even up to the point of seeing what goes into eternity, you're ready to be there then. But John knew his time had not come yet. And he fell at the feet of the angel. And the angel said, to him, see you do it not, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren the prophets and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Remember that even before Jesus came, even during the time of Noah, there were angels that walked the earth giving the word of God out to people and teaching people. Even up to the time of Jesus Christ and then from the time of Christ until now, no, there are no angels. There are only messengers that are walking this world. But during the time of the seven-year period, those angels will be back because the people of this earth will need to hear all of these holy angels talking to them, telling them, look, this is the way it is. God is on the throne. And the prince of this earth has been de deceiving you all these years. And there's going to be many that go, eh, I'd rather believe the prince of darkness and not the God that sits on the throne. And we just have to be understanding that every one of us has a choice to make and they made theirs. He says, worship God. And he says to me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. In other words, remember back in Daniel, the angel told him, to see, or excuse me, it was Jesus that told him to seal up the words of the prophecy that was given him back then because the time was not yet. Well, it was during this time that he was giving all of this that the, that the prophecies of Daniel now were open. Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. 
He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. In other words, the time is now upon us. How he finds us when he returns is how we will enter into the seven years of testing. Most of us, all of us sitting here will be up there with him getting ready to come back at the end of the seven years. The others will be going through here on earth, hopefully not for long. Some of them will get smart and come up at mid-trib. If you are not looking for him during his, at his return, he is not looking for you when he returns. You know that your eternal destination is assured. Why not also get to know who Jesus is and what the reward is that he brings with him? Because in verse 12 it says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. To give to every man according to, as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, they that, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loves and makes a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come and let him that hears and let him that is thirsty come and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely what is the water of life it is the word of God he says take it freely for I testify to you and this is why 99.9% .9 of the pastors will not teach this for I testify to every man that hears the words of this prophecy of this book, if any man shall add to these things, God shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. I have no desire to have all those plagues given to me that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, out of the holy city, and from the things which are written within this book. I don't desire that either. He which testifies, which is Jesus Christ, he which testifies these things said, Surely I come quickly. Amen. And all of his people say, Even so come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. Amen.